I guess I'd like to get started uh, with the uh, second part of our tutorial. Um, uh, but before, uh, before we do, uh, I'd like to just uh, announce that after this session, there will be a reception and an outreach closer session on the 11th floor of the Gamma Tower um, immediately following this session. So just go out to the uh, uh, area office at the uh, physics office there and take the elevator to the 11th floor. So that will be happening after this session. Uh, our uh, next speaker is Elena Rebendiff from the State University, and she's going to be telling us about uh, fundamentals and the recent advances. Thank you, Matt. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers of uh, the conference around Smiling and uh, Mel Park for uh, uh, inviting uh, me to, to this wonderful place where so many wonderful things were done uh, about like crystals and uh, many other things in physics and not only in physics. So, so today I will uh, try to introduce you to the fundamentals of uh, liquid crystals and uh, then briefly outline some of the research that uh, we do at the liquid crystal institute. Uh, I uh, will uh, use some of the information about the history of the crystal that uh, uh, I found in the wonderful book that I would recommend to everyone on uh, the history of the crystals. It's uh, called the history of microphone working. Oh, it's. It should be a little higher up there. I'll show you. Sorry. Yeah, I think it's better. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that, um, describes uh, the entire history of uh, the crystals, which is uh, now more than uh, 120 years old, according to the official records. According to non-official, it's at least 150 years old, because that was about the time when the first ever article uh, appeared, uh, in which uh, the double melting point of uh, some constable derivatives uh, was described. And uh, that, by the way, happened uh, uh, to be written by the professor of Leaf uh, University, uh, the, the place uh, where one of our chairs is uh, from. Uh, but uh, the, the true history started in 1888 when uh, Lemon and uh, Reinitzer uh, realized that they are dealing with uh, some specific state of uh, matter. So I will uh, cover um, along the fundamentals also some history of the crystals. And then uh, in the original part, I will use uh, research that uh, was done in collaboration with uh, graduate students at uh, the Lake Crystal Institute uh, on Kushnaka, in Jabu, Yeyin, Andriy Golovin and uh, Sergei Shanovsky, and uh, uh, in collaboration with my colleague Jack uh, Kelvin, professor at CPIB, which is the graduate program at uh, the Lake Crystal Institute, and his student, uh, Shopping Ken. And uh, just one slide about our collaboration with uh, Korean uh, Advanced uh, Institute of uh, Science and Technology. They produce some wonderful templating for colloids using smectic curling crystals, and uh, uh, we collaborated with them on that project. So uh, this is the outline from the talk. I will start just with the fundamentals, which in my mind uh, can be covered in just uh, two slides. Literally, one is about the order that is uh, present in the crystalline phases, and the second slide is uh, three basic things that I hope uh, you will remember after this lecture, and really this is the only three things that uh, you need to remember to know the fundamentals of from this uh, state of matter. Uh, then I will reiterate these fundamentals by going through the history of the crystals, and then uh, in the second part I will talk a little bit about so-called dielectric dispersion effects related to the fact that uh, dielectric susceptibility of the crystal is frequency dependent and how it can influence things such as uh, switch and speed of the liquid crystal. And um, I will uh, conclude with a small section on uh, colloids and dynamics of colloids in the environment of the liquid crystal. So now, uh, what is the liquid crystal? In the simplest terms, it's uh, an intermediate phase, a thermodynamically stable phase between a solid crystal and an isotropic fluid in which we have an orientation of order, but uh, no positional order, or at least a very little positional order, such as one-dimensional positional order in uh, smartness. It's uh, a non-polar phase. It means that uh, although locally each molecule might have uh, some well-defined dipole moment, its neighbors will have a dipole moment that 
is oriented uh, in an opposite direction, or as some method, so on average, the spontaneous polarization of the simplest carbonic crystal, the so-called pneumatic, is uh, zero. Uh, the orientation of order is uh, normally described with the concept of the tractor, which is just an axis that uh, points in the direction of average polar core orientation, and as you can from the slide, the states with n and minus n are equivalent because the material is again non polar. This uh, orientation of order and the absence of positional order bring three fundamental issues to the behavior of the materials, and those are the fundamentals in my mind that uh, I would like to, to present as the basic physics of um, the pneumatic vacuum crystal. So first of all, if you put this uh, orientation of order pneumatic fluid um, into some container, then there will be molecular interaction between the the crystal and the walls of the container. And uh, since the interactions are anisotropic, generally in nature, that would mean that the bounded wall would impose some particular direction of the molecular orientation. And in this particular case, I just showed that uh, the substrate causes homogeneous planar orientation or tangential orientation of the molecules. Now, if you want to deviate this orientation to change it, you have to apply some external tool. You have to perform some work. And the quantitative measure of how much work you have to spend to deviate the director from this proper easy axis at the substrate can be described by the so-called anchoring potential that was first introduced in a slightly different form from what is written on the uh, slide. Uh, that uh, represents some coefficient W, the so-called anchoring strength. And then uh, the measure of how much you deviate the director from the easy axis, theta squared. Not linear function of theta, but theta squared, because theta and minus theta are equivalent things. Now, if uh, you have uh, this container that uh, imposes its surface anchoring on the crystal director, clearly within the bulk you should accommodate between different uh, orientation actions of different walls, and you will create special distortions of the director, you will create special gradients of, of the director. And uh, since the molecules are no longer parallel to each other, it also creates some strains, some deformations, and that is associated with some elastic energy. And typically, the elastic energy density associated with these uh, distortions is uh, proportional to the gradient of uh, the director field squared. Again, yeah, it cannot be a linear term, it should be squared, because otherwise you would have uh, some states that uh, you would prefer to be in this form state. And uh, finally, the third fundamental issue about the medical crystal is that uh, it's uh, a fluid that is anisotropic. And uh, the most uh, profound anisotropy that uh, we use in modern technologies is uh, the anisotropy of uh, dielectric properties. Um, the dielectric permittivity measured along the director and in the direction perpendicular to the director would be different in such a material. And this is precisely the property that is used in uh, reorienting the crystal cells with uh, applied electric field. Uh, you might uh, notice that um, the effect is uh, essential quadratic in uh, the applied electric field. You have a scalar product between the director and the electric field and uh, that product is square, and the sign, in other words, the direction into which the director field reorients the liquid crystal, uh, would depend on the dielectric anisotropy the delta epsilon. It might be positive, on many materials it is positive, that means that the director would try to be parallel to the applied electric field, or it might be negative, and in that way, in that case, you would have uh, uh, an orientation that is perpendicular to the project. Now let's uh, go through some of the history of uh, the crystal science. The, the first uh, kind of well-developed classification and terminology was introduced by George Friedel in 1922. He invented the term pneumatic, and the term comes from the Greek word pneuma, which means thread in English. And so why it's uh, 
problematic and uh, what the threats have to do with this type of like crystal is uh, probably made clear by looking at the simplest unaligned sample of the liquid crystal. I'm not sure why it's not. It did. So why doesn't it move? It's moving on the screen. Okay. Yeah, okay, so what you have here is just two glass plates and a droplet of an emetic like crystal between them. And uh, then you shear the top glass plate with respect to the bottom and the material flows. And uh, what you see is uh, some dark uh, regions and bright regions that uh, correspond simply to the feature of the like crystal being a biofringent material. But then you see that the shear suddenly kind of creates some threads that flow in the plane of the cell. And then when you stop the shear, these uh, threads return to their original position, which is apparently perpendicular to the plate. So that's why you don't see most of them. But you still see a couple of them that are on the left, on the left uh, hand side of uh, the uh, slide. And uh, those are defects in the molecular orientation of uh, the lake crystal. And uh, those are what we currently called destinations, and uh, this appearance of defects was the reason why uh, Friedel decided to call this material animatic. Uh, nowadays we know that uh, there is not just one type of animatic, it's not just a simple picture that uh, you have a lot of like, molecules uh, arranged parallel to each other. Um, uh, you, you might have um, also a material in which the molecules resemble disks rather than rods, and in that case it's their planes that are parallel to each other, but still we can introduce some single orientation uh, called game director that uh, signifies the average uh, orientation of the molecules. And uh, materials of the discotic types were uh, invented and uh, synthesized and uh, proven to be pneumatic crystals uh, relatively recently in uh, the late 70s. Then uh, there is uh, also a very peculiar type of uh, pneumatics in which instead of just one axis of orientation, you have uh, three or two because if you have two, then the third is fine automatically. And those are called uh, biaxial pneumatic crystals. And uh, uh, they were originally invented or discovered uh, in uh, biotopic crystals. Those the crystals are formed when you dissolve certain materials in water or in other solvent. Uh, and uh, for many years, uh, many research groups tried to uh, prove their existence in so-called technotropic materials. Those are materials that I'm dealing with in this tutorial. In this case, you don't need any uh, solvent. You just uh, keep the sample and it uh, mounts from the molecular crystalline form into the thick crystalline form. So, for those type of technotropic materials, the biaxial phase uh, was uh, uh, discovered uh, as a uh, well-defined phase uh, uh, very recently. And there is still a lot of research uh, in the area and many different uh, models and approaches to describe the state are uh, uh, developed. I would like to say that uh, uh, the person who discovered the Bayek cell pneumatics uh, also did many other things uh, in the science of the crystals. So, uh, Alfred Zaupan, uh, he developed the first uh, into theory of cooperative orientation of water in the crystal, the so-called uh, meyer salpan theory. Uh, he also uh, made uh, an observation that uh, the electric field of uh, light might reorient the liquid crystal, uh, the so-called optical feathering effect. Somehow he never published this uh, discovery. We just learned that uh, uh, he died a uh, few days ago last Sunday at uh, his home in uh, Germany. He, he spent a lot of time, about 25 years, working uh, in the United States at the liquid crystal Institute in Canada. So, uh, back to the history. In uh, the very same article that uh, introduced pneumatics as the term, uh, Friedel made a wonderful observation uh, about smectics. Uh, from, um, yeah, I will talk about this a little bit later, sorry. Uh, coming back to this uh, texture, uh, the physicist uh, around uh, solid state physics, if you can call it uh, science at that time, were wondering how one can describe the uh, deformed state of uh, liquid crystals such as uh, destinations and the linear defects. And uh, it was uh, Ozen who proposed uh, the first uh, 
theory of elasticity of the magnetic field crystals. So, about 25 years later, uh, Frank um, rewrote this uh, theory, basically introducing a couple of uh, original things, but in essence, it was the same theory that uh, Posen proposed. And uh, now, this this uh, expression at the end forms something that uh, every student uh, in the crystal research is familiar with, but uh, each and every person that is outside the field gets immediately scared by the form in which uh, this uh, energy is represented and uh, I would like to spend just a couple of uh, minutes explaining what it is here. So, if you change the orientation of the lip crystals uh, from ideal uniform in space orientation to distorted orientation, you can describe uh, the ensuing elastic energy as uh, the Taylor series around the very small distortions with respect to the ideal state. So you would have some uh, expansion in Taylor series. You might have some linear current if the uh, uh, system is some um, like linear. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. normally so you might miles showing the image. Yeah. So you would have the linear term and then quadratic term of the deri derivatives and uh, something else. But if you're interested in real linear distortions, that means that uh, your gradients are much smaller than uh, um, the reciprocal um, molecular scale, then uh, you can cut this expansion at uh, the, let's say, this third term, and then you can realize that you can simplify the expression by noticing some similarities of the magnetic crystal. For example, that it's a variant under the uh, change of n into minus n and uh, others. And uh, after you are done with that similar consideration, you realize that there are the three basic uh, terms that contain the square of the first derivatives of the director, and uh, those are the divergence n squared, n curve n squared, and n cross curve n squared. And uh, these three have a very simple geometrical form. So splaying is just uh, when you spread your fingers, this is the perfect uh, uh, illustration of the splay deformation for molecules in or for the director field in the pneumatic crystal. It can be two-dimensional or three-dimensional. Uh, all other uh, types of deformations are not present in the display. Twist is uh, what we already heard today during the presentation on cholesteric crystal. Cholesteric is a simple example of pure twist. And uh, finally, bend is uh, shown at the bottom. Uh, in this case, divergence n and n curl n are zeros, and only the vector product of n and curl n are in zero. Uh, is in zero quantity. Uh, the question about uh, what are the typical values of the elastic constants that uh, control the elastic distortions in the electricity, k1, k2, k3. Uh, one way of reasoning might be as follows. You know that uh, the crystals would melt into the isotropic phase uh, at uh, around uh, some room temperature, some others at about 100 degrees centigrade, and apparently the thermal energy that corresponds to the room temperature to about 100 C uh, is the energy that can be associated with the strength of the pneumatic order. So one can estimate A as this thermal energy divided by the typical scale in the system, and typical length scale in the system can be only the length of the molecule. There is nothing else in there to determine the value of this A. So if I will take U that corresponds to the room temperature and A that corresponds to the typical molecular length, we will get a quantity that is about uh, 5 uh, piconewtons. And it turns out if you do the experiments in modern laboratory, uh, that uh, this estimate is exactly what you would measure, something between a uh, couple of newtons and uh, 10, a couple of piconewtons and uh, 10 piconewtons. So um, coming back to the uh, defects that gave the name of the pneumatic crystals, uh, the first theory by Ozen already uh, discussed the singularities that would appear on the bulk of the lake crystal, and then Fan put it on a more uh, rigorous basis, and uh, he calculated the direct distributions around the singular cores that should exist in the pneumatic lake crystal when such a defect is introduced. And it's uh, amazing that uh, it took, uh, what, uh, 
14 years before this model was uh, shown to be not exactly complete or rather to, better to say, over complete. It turned out that this type of uh, discriminations in which the director rotates once around the core when you go once around the core, they're not stable with respect to this simple transformation. If you pull the director along the axis of the defect, then the singularity vanishes and uh, the defect uh, is no more than singularity. And uh, it took another four or five years uh, before people realized that, uh, in fact, this is not a surprising physical fact. It's not just the, the question of uh, calculating the energy of the state. It's, uh, it's just the symmetry of the pneumatic crystal. People introduced the general scheme of classifying all possible topological defects that might exist in a certain medium, no matter how complex it might look to the researcher. And uh, the type of, um, so they established a one-to-one -one correspondence between the symmetry and the type of order in the medium and uh, the type of defects that can survive in such a medium. And according to this uh, scheme, there is only one type of defects in the crystal, and those defects can be represented by this demonstration, or they can be represented what is often called a discrimination with a negative one half sign. But uh, it turns out that negative one half and positive one half can be smoothly transformed one way into one into another. So it's not really two separate types of defects, the very same defect. It uh, took uh, some time again in, along this uh, development of the defects to realize that um, defects are not necessarily something that um, uh, brings uh, the system in the state out of equilibrium. In certain situations you might have uh, a system that uh, exists in equilibrium thanks to defects and uh, this uh, particular example deals with uh, droplets of the liquid crystal dispersed in the polymer matrix and depending on the anchoring and the interface between the polymer, which looks black here, and the liquid crystal, which is uh, bright, you might have uh, different distorted states with uh, topological defects, in this case point defects, either at the poles or in the center, that provide the equilibrium of the entire system. And it's interesting to know that uh, since the elastic forces uh, you remember that the density was proportional to k over r squared. If you take the volume integral of uh, this uh, energy density over the volume of the sphere, you realize that the elastic energy stored in this droplet scales linearly with the size of the problem. On the other hand, the surface anchoring tries to pay for this alignment at the surface, the interface between the polar and the crystal is obviously proportional to the area of the interface, so it's uh, R squared. And then we realize that uh, as uh, the system becomes larger and larger, as the radius of the droplet increases, the surface term becomes a dominant term in the behavior of the system. It's kind of counterintuitive thing, but it tells you that if the droplet is sufficiently large, larger than this ratio k over w, then uh, you would have a distorted state that would satisfy the boundary conditions, in this case normal, and uh, contain some topological defects. But if uh, the system is small, then uh, the director will try to be uniform, and uh, that would come at the expense of uh, violated uh, boundary conditions. Uh, yeah, one more common problem here is that uh, uh, this value of W just turns out experimentally to be in the range shown here. And uh, there is no way to simply explain this range of values that the anchoring coefficient adopts from a simple physical picture like the one was, that was used in the discussion on the values of K. Uh, just an experimental fact. And what is interesting is that um, uh, the ratio here is no longer close to any molecular scale in the liquid crystal. Typically, it's uh, many orders of magnitude higher, so it's about uh, uh, 0.1 micrometer when you take the ratio of the two. And uh, finally, in the 80s, people realized that uh, the not only the special boundary conditions can give you 
a state in which the defects belong to the equilibrium state of the system. But uh, also, the, the, the entire phase might be composed of the lattice of defects very similar to the aggregates of phase, aggregates of phase in uh, uh, superconducting phase. And uh, the first uh, hypothesis of that was uh, published by Alfred Zalka, but then more rigorous uh, models followed uh, in which uh, the so-called blue phase, the phase which is similar to a cholesterol but has helical twist, not in just one direction, but uh, in two perpendicular directions. Uh, and uh, such a um, double twist is possible only if you interrupt this uh, twist with uh, two axes with the lattice of defects that uh, uh, keep the things uh, uh, possible to repeat in space and form a three-dimensional uh, system. And uh, finally, in late uh, 80s, uh, it was the Lubensky group who proposed a system that is very similar to the original Agricos of Phase. Uh, here you, you, you have the lattice of um, dislocations, screw dislocations, that uh, uh, break the layer system of a smectic into small blocks. And uh, this uh, lattice of uh, screw dislocations allow you to introduce a twist into the system that is composed of layers. And uh, we have a continuation of this uh, research nowadays uh, in uh, uh, this uh, university and all part uh, looks into the uh, distorted uh, states of the smectics that can be described with local curvatures and defects and then became in a few candidates uh, models of such uh, phases. So coming back to the classification, I uh, I spoke a little bit just during the last uh, slide about the smectics. So smectics uh, were again introduced uh, as a concept by the same man, uh, George Fidel, in the same year, 1922. And uh, he concluded that uh, these phases must be very, very similar to the pneumatics in the sense that they form an orientational phase, a phase in which the molecules are oriented along in the same direction. But he also said that this uh, orientation is uh, accompanied by one-dimensional periodic structure. So that the layers form, uh, that the molecules form flexible layers uh, about uh, the thickness of which is about molecular length. And uh, he was able to do so just by observing these formations, ellipses and sometimes they purple. From this single texture, he was able to conclude uh, that uh, asthmatic is formed by one-dimensional periodic structure of uh, length. And uh, the reason is that, uh, as we understand it now, if uh, I take a system of uh, layers that are flexible and uh, consider what might be the elastic energy of uh, their distortions imposed, for example, by the confining geometry of the vessel in which I have my uh, smectic material, then I realize that, okay, I have the curvature term, which is very similar to this friend posing term. It's just here, instead of divergence and I use the principal radial curvature of the layers. Plus, I have something like um, compressibility term, which tells me how much energy do I need to spend to change the distance between the layers. And then, if I uh, consider the ratio of these two terms, I would realize that uh, this ratio of the curvature term and the compressibility of the relation term is uh, much smaller than unity if the scale of distortions is macroscopic, if the sample is uh, large. And uh, that means that uh, in many cases when you're dealing with a large sample, microns, tens of microns, you can safely neglect this uh, dilation or compressibility term and deal only with the curvature. So, in other words, the layers would like to be curved rather than uh, uh, stressed to change their thickness. And then uh, we are in the domain of pure geometry. The question is, so what are the configurations of uh, the system of layers that would prefer to be equidistant so that they don't change their thickness, but at the very same time have to adopt some curved, uh, different curved uh, configurations in space. Turns out that you can describe the defects that would occur in this case uh, with the notion of focal surfaces. So you have the principal right of curvature at each and every point. And uh, then if you pack a 
next layer to, to its neighbor and go uh, with this procedure, you will find that at some point the radius of capture goes into zero. That means that your elastic energy is diverging. You don't want this defect to exist. And uh, the simplest way to avoid huge energy panel is associated with these focal surfaces is to reduce the entire dimensionality of the focal surface to from a surface to a light. And that's exactly what uh, Mother Nature does in the case of uh, smack effect crystal. It reduces these focal surfaces into pairs of, of lines. In this simplest case, I have a straight line and then a circle, and uh, the straight line goes through the center of the circle, and uh, the surfaces are equidistant layers of the smack effect. No matter where you measure the distance between the surfaces, it's always the same thing. It's always the same uh, distance. Um, you can also see that this geometry of the simplest toroidal focal plane domain allows you to smoothly embed the uh, system of curved layers into the otherwise uh, ideal sample in which the layers are horizontal. And uh, this little movie shows the process under the microscope. You see how this focal plane domains pop up from the flat system of layers and fill the entire space. A little bit uh, more complex geometry, and you realize how this uh, simplest focal point domain can be transformed into what uh, Friedau saw under the microscope. In which case, I said he observed ellipses. So, if you transform the circle into the ellipse, this straight line goes into the hyperbolic line, and uh, you still have the same uh, structure of equidistant layers that uh, possess only linear focal surfaces, only linear defects which greatly helps in uh, saving the elastic energy. So coming back to the uh, olive history, to the third fundamental thing of olive crystals, it's the uh, field-induced impacts, the fact that the things are um, anisotropic from the point of view of their dielectric and their magnetic properties. It was um, several Frederick's uh, working in Leningrad at that time uh, who realized that uh, if uh, he puts a liquid crystal between a lens and a flat plate and uh, applies voltage, you would see some reorientation of the molecules and uh, there is a connection between the local thickness of the sample and the threshold field at which this reorientation would occur that uh, goes like shown here. And uh, later, the first experiment was with the magnetic field. Later he produced uh, similar experiments with the um, electric field and uh, this is what we currently know as the basic Frederick's defect that uh, we use in um, numerous informational displays. Uh, between uh, 1935, when he wrote his last paper, and uh, some early 60s, mid 60s, nothing essential happened. Uh, by the way, Frederick himself was arrested by Stalin and sent to Siberia, and he died uh, in 1943. And uh, after 1935, he, he didn't have an opportunity to be in jail, have an opportunity to do anything uh, about science of liquid crystals. But uh, in the uh, late 60s, the interest uh, to the studies of uh, the Frederick's defect returned because people started to realize that uh, these materials can be used as uh, uh, materials for uh, displays to show some numbers, some characters. And uh, simultaneously, in the United States, at the uh, Lake Crystal Institute in Penn, uh, Jim Ferguson uh, observed the so-called twist pneumatic effect. And uh, approximately at the very same time, Martin Schott and Wolfgang Palfrey in Switzerland observed uh, the very same thing. They patented uh, the observations, and uh, this is uh, what we know now that twist pneumatic cell display. So the cell is formed by uh, two plates that uh, direct uh, liquid crystal molecules in two perpendicular directions. So you have a twist by 90 degrees. When you apply the field, the molecules reorient parallel to the field, and in that way you change the ability of the liquid crystal to transmit polarized light. So if you put it between two cross polarizers, 
you want to get different transmitters in the field on and field off. Okay. And uh, this simple principle and its variations, so-called uh, vertical alignment, this is the case when the molecules are original and vertical, and uh, then you switch them by the electric field to become horizontal. Or the so-called in-plane switching, when the molecules are all, always in the plane of the cell, you just reorient them uh, in this plane from x axis to the y axis. So all these uh, simple uh, geometries uh, give rise to the industry that is uh, currently at the level of uh, revenue, $127 billion. And why is that? Why it's so huge? Simple because uh, they are everywhere. You, you, you have your laptop screen, you have your flat panel monitor for the desktop screen, you have a little camera, you have GPS, you have your uh, game gizmo, uh, you have your refrigerator with uh, a little crystal screen. <laughs> you have many things, a printer, um, games, and finally this huge um, uh, flat panel TV screens. Everywhere these three little geometries are uh, creating images for you. And um, so that is uh, how the history transformed into a huge, huge uh, part of our uh, life nowadays. So um, now I believe I have um, time about oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, to talk about um, some uh, recent research that uh, uh, we do at uh, Willie Crystal Institute. So um, at last uh, International Willie Crystal Conference in um, Korea, uh, the Vice President of Samsung, uh, Samsung is one of the most uh, successful, the, the most successful company in the field of uh, uh, producing the lead crystal displays. He said that uh, one of the two problems is uh, that uh, the speed with which the lead crystal cells uh, switch is not uh, good enough, it's too slow. And uh, we heard today uh, in the talk uh, by Dr. Martinez about the adaptive optics that speed, the switching speed is uh, still the Achilles cable of the lake crystal devices. So uh, here is the scheme of the vertical aligned cell when it is switched. So originally, as I said, you have molecules that are perpendicular to the plates, to the electrodes. When you apply the voltage, delta epsilon in this case is negative, the molecules want to become perpendicular to the direction of the applied field. The switching time of this process is uh, a function of the thickness of the cell D and its D squared, of the viscosity of the material, which is gamma, of the elastic constant, K, and uh, also of the applied field. So this you see is uh, some constant that you can associate with the uh, threshold at which the lead crystal starts to reopen. So, uh, and this is uh, something that immediately suggests the way to improve this field. It tells you that let's increase U, the driving voltage, and then tau will drop down. That is fine. But uh, the, the problem with the opposite direction of this transition is uh, apparently more serious one because here I just uh, switch off the voltage and the switching time is uh, proportional to just the material parameters. K, gamma, and uh, the thickness of the cell. And uh, of course, uh, chemists do wonderful, synthesize wonderful new materials in which gamma is small and K is appropriate. But still, with the best uh, chemistry and the best approaches to the cell construction, uh, the record time for pneumatic switching are about four to eight milliseconds when we are talking about the switch pump state. So it's not clear how to produce uh, better <coughs> top off uh, simply because it's a passive process that doesn't depend on the applied field. For the non direction, as I said, it's uh, kind of uh, <coughs> self-suggesting. Um, and indeed, uh, some 10 years ago, Takanashi, McLennan, and Clark here demonstrated uh, nanosecond speed of uh, switching. They used a special scheme of driving the uh, typical lead crystal material, 5CB, with a very steep front, and uh, of course that uh, also required huge voltage, and they demonstrated about 10 nanoseconds of switching. Still, it wasn't uh, the instantaneous ideal switching. The, the response of the material didn't uh, follow the shape of the applied uh, pulse, and uh, 
they suggested that probably issues such as dielectric dispersion and uh, uh, dielectric heating might be involved. And so we got interested uh, with uh, the speed of switching, and uh, our original work was okay, let's try this dual frequency cinematics. So it's uh, uh, known, it, it was all known long before us that those are the materials that uh, have a peculiar properties. So if you change the frequency at which you drive your lead crystal from low to high, then um, the low frequencies of the dielectric and isotropy is positive. But then on the high frequencies, it switches because of the dielectric relaxation in the parallel component of the uh, dielectric uh, constant. And uh, this uh, anisotropy becomes negative. And the idea is very simple. Prepare yourself in such a way that uh, the director makes an angle of 45 degrees with respect to the normal. And then uh, send a pulse of low frequency, it would reorient the lake crystal in the vertical direction. Then send a pulse at high frequency, it would orient the lake crystal in uh, the horizontal direction. And uh, this uh, angle of 45 degrees assure you that the torque that acts on the lake crystal is maximized. Because if you look at the mathematical expression for the value of torque, it, it contains the sines better and cosine better of the angle between the field and uh, the magnetic crystal. So uh, we hope that uh, we would uh, get something out of this. And we did, in fact, we learned that uh, there is no way to make this uh, thing as fast as we wish. If uh, you look, for example, at this um, result from the experiment, here is the voltage pulse that you send. And this is just a kind of easy pulse. You see that the start from doesn't cause an immediate optical response of the system. The director doesn't reorient at the moment when you send this electric pulse. There is some delay, 25 microseconds in this case, rather significant. And only after that, the liquid crystal director starts to reorient. And uh, it's uh, kind of clear from the very scheme of the entire approach why this phenomenon is happening. Simply because when you send this uh, sharp front, it is perceived by the liquid crystal as the high frequency excitation. And at high frequency, the atom is negative. So before the liquid crystal realizes that this is a DC pulse, a low frequency excitation, uh, some time will elapse, and even this time the liquid crystal just doesn't know which way to, to, to reorient. And this is the physical picture uh, that uh, limits some uh, the speed of speech. So we wanted to be able to describe this process analytically, to be able to say what is that torque that hangs on the lead crystal and how it evolves less time. And the problem was that um, if you look at the uh, textbooks uh, describing the crystal electro-optics, you will find that okay, this is the torque, which is the product of um, electric displacement D and the electric field. And the electric displacement D is a function of the E, this is kind of response function of the material to the applied electric field. But uh, you will notice that uh, this uh, theory that is currently used consider this electric response as an instantaneous thing. So if I'm interested in the electric displacement at the moment of time T, it depends solely on the value of the electric field, the applied electric field, at the very same moment T. And uh, of course, as we know from um, the classic books on dielectric uh, properties of isotopic fluids, for example, it's not true. The electric displacement, for example, in isotopic fluids is uh, described as the sum of some instantaneous term and the track history of the sample, where you have the time integral of the electric field that acted before the time t, actually from the Big Bang moment, but uh, device uh, uh, came up with a smart assumption how to get rid of the Big Bang uh, effect. He, he said that, okay, this uh, process should be kind of fast and should relax uh, in a normal way, so he introduced this uh, uh, for that is an exponential for the step function that enters here under the integral that tells you how important this prehistory effect is on the entire value of 
the electric displacement at the moment that you are interested in. And uh, so it um, turns out that uh, many materials just simply follow this uh, Dubai model. They really show exponential type of um, the electric relaxation. And this theory is very successful in describing the properties of um, isotopic fluids. But for liquid crystals, it simply wasn't developed because um, it's, uh, it's not that easy. In liquid crystal, not only uh, there is a uh, fact that um, the value of D depends on the best values of the electric field. It's also that uh, while you're watching this developing, the liquid crystal reorients. You apply the field, the liquid crystal starts to reorient. And uh, it's not only E and D that change in time, but it's also the epsilon the components of the dielectric tender that change during the reorientation of the uh, of the uh, liquid crystal. I, I should say that uh, the components remain the same, but since the orientation changes, the material kind of shows either epsilon parallel or epsilon perpendicular. And so, uh, if you apply the divine model to describe the core, which is the product of D and E, uh, for the liquid crystal, you would come up with this rather a complicated expression. So I'm not going to explain all the features at once, but uh, let's just look uh, at this as, as the sum of two terms. And let's just pay attention to the fact that uh, the dielectric and isotropy, written here explicitly, this is the epsilon at high frequency for the parallel component, and this is the epsilon at high frequency for perpendicular component. Uh, so this is one uh, term. The second term that contains this memory effect has uh, also an anisotropy of dielectric properties, but here it's a different anisotropy. It measures the difference between the epsilon or parallel component at low frequency and the epsilon and parallel component for high frequency. Clearly, these things are not the same, but moreover, in some cases, they might be even of opposite sign. And that was some, something that uh, intrigued us. Uh, because that means that if you apply electric pulse, this term would tell it to uh, go horizontal. But the second term, yellow one, would tell it go vertical. And uh, this confusion will last as long as the liquid crystal remembers the prehistory of the electric field. So, and uh, here is the typical um, dual frequency material in which you can observe the balance the, the war between these two terms, uh, especially on the clear. So this is the epsilon parallel that uh, experiences relaxation as you change the frequency. It goes from high values to low values. And epsilon perpendicular is uh, kind of constant. So uh, these two terms correspond to the, the blue one corresponds to this difference, and the yellow one corresponds to this difference. And um, uh, it was very easy to demonstrate that depending on the rate with which you increase your voltage in the system, the tax on the system. You can uh, reorient the director either horizontally or vertically, um, uh, depending on uh, which term wins. And then we went to uh, consider the same thing for uh, 5 CB, the material that is uh, typically used in uh, or similar material to what is used in uh, modern displays. And uh, the dispersion curves are a little bit more uh, complicated here, you also have a huge relaxation in epsilon parallel, but epsilon perpendicular also changes. And so uh, it turns out that when you add the necessary components to the theory, you can really describe the optical signal in a 5 CB case with the model that takes into account this dielectric dispersion much better than uh, in the case when you neglect the dielectric dispersion, when you neglect this uh, new part in the theory. By the way, that, that was one uh, experiment in which uh, we realized that uh, little things such as uh, the length of your cables that you use in the experiments do matter. Uh, the speed of switching is uh, the order of uh, nanoseconds. And it turns out that uh, if you increase a uh, cable in one of the two shoulders of your measuring system but by just uh, one meter, that implies a shift in about one nanoseconds on the time scale. So we, we, we have to be careful with cutting proper lengths of the cable so that we don't um, introduce some uh, error in uh, our experiments. But the overall um, experiment was uh, just a copy of uh, the uh, earlier experiment. Uh, uh, 
go around the world and particularly use very small tiny cells to decrease the RC value of the cells. So uh, that is not that exciting. Uh, it just tells you that you, you have the model to describe more or less accurately why the liquid crystal cell doesn't switch as fast as you would like to have. But then we found something in the model that can help you in fact, to increase the skin in a rather non trivial fashion. So let's take a look again at this expression. So it, it is composed of two terms. This first term, uh, if you look at it, uh, contains E here and E here, so it's E squared. But this term, the new part, has E under the integral. So by the time you integrate, there is no dependence on E. There is only this contribution that tells you how the tour depends on the state of the electric field at this moment of time. So that means that you have some contribution that is linear in E, and uh, you can try to use it uh, to accelerate the switching of the hematic cell, especially in the regime when you switch off the field. So here is the simple physics picture. Suppose I had some electric pulse that reoriented the liquid crystal vertically. And uh, that was for a material for delta F, so this delta F that is possible. So there is this polarization that is there simply because I had a, an electric pulse acting on the liquid crystal. Now I switch the pulse of voltage off. This P doesn't disappear immediately. It relaxes with some typical time, which might be very short. But if during this time, when it is still in existence, I apply an electric field that is opposite to the direction of P, then I can accelerate the reorientation of P into the state that characterizes field of state. And the same uh, picture is applicable for the case when delta epsilon is negative. Here I apply the field, I have some uh, small polarization, and then if I want to switch this uh, liquid crystal back to the vertical orientation from the uh, orientation in the field that is horizontal, then I apply the tail field that would accelerate this uh, electric. So here is the experiment that just shows what I just uh, quantitated with that. So we, we deal with the material with which uh, delta epsilon is negative. And uh, you might see here that uh, there is a dispersion is that in epsilon particle, and delta epsilon is such that it's everywhere negative. It's uh, uh, slightly larger at high frequencies than at low frequencies. So here is the voltage profile. So first, this is the voltage that was applied, and then I shut it off. And uh, the typical way to do it is just to have it at zero, and this uh, uh, red line shows the standard uh, approach. If you look at the optical signal, the response follows this uh, red line, which is practically horizontal. The liquid crystal is really slow in responding to the switch off. But then what I do, instead of just going to zero, I provide a tail to the back side of the voltage pulse, and suddenly I see that the liquid crystal accelerates. If I provide a proper amplitude and duration of this tail, I would see that we have a significant uh, acceleration that is visible immediately after the switch off and uh, during the longer scale of observations. If I am wrong with the polarization, with the direction of this electric field, then of course I would get a wrong uh, result. My speed wouldn't be accelerated, but just uh, would be delayed. So by properly designing this uh, tail of the switch off, Pulse, I can really accelerate um, the switch off process of the pneumatic switch. So, this is the conclusion of this uh, part, which is very simple. So, the dielectric uh, dispersion impact do really matter in uh, the electrolytical response of the big crystals of the pneumatic type uh, and, of course, of uh, all other types. Uh, but uh, we just didn't uh, look into uh, that uh, portion of facilities. And uh, this uh, delicate dispersion effect leads to rather unusual impact. If you want to switch your liquid crystal faster, you don't drop the voltage to zero immediately. You might wish to make a kind of a tail, exponential gain tail, that would help the liquid crystal to relax. And uh, finally, the last.
section of this talk is about colloidal particles. You heard about colloidal particles and optical feathers and uh, the ways to move them and to study them. And that was uh, most of the time for isotropic environment. Now we put the colloidal particles in the lake crystal. And uh, here is uh, what happens. As in the case of uh, lake crystal droplets, uh, many things will depend on the size of this colloid. If um, I compare the surface anchoring that uh, goes as square of the radius and the elasticity that is again linear with uh, the size of uh, the inclusion, then uh, I would uh, realize that uh, the larger droplets or inclusions, particles, would try to preserve boundary conditions to satisfy this portion and will distort the length crystal around them. If I put the particle in the monocrystalline environment, it means that outside, far away from this particle, the length crystal is uniform, then I will realize that um, the distortions are not just of any type, the distortions should somehow satisfy the condition that I should go from the distorted state to the uniform state. And uh, this situation was beautifully described by uh, uh, Lubensky and White and uh, their colleagues uh, in this article. They demonstrated that you have this uh, kind of structural dipole where the uh, distortions induced by the particle are topologically balanced by the defect, so-called hyperbolic hedgehog that sits nearby of the particle. So, our motivation was to study how these things with the distorted director would move in uh, the liquid light environment. And uh, I will show you the experiment that uh, gives you the answer to the question. So, here what you see is the dispersion of these uh, particles in the flat pneumatic cell. And uh, the dipoles can be left or right. You see that the symmetry of these images is somewhat uh, different. And uh, when you apply electric field that uh, is directed perpendicularly to the plates and reorients the liquid crystal, it turns out that uh, the particles move. But see, left particles move to left and right particles move to right. You would never observe a different direction of motion. There are no tweezers that do the job. There are no strings attached to the particles. It's just uh, you know, no hands uh, experiment in which the only thing that you change is the electric field that again is directed perpendicularly to the direction of the motion. So what is going on? And here, uh, to uh, decipher the physics, we have to move to the uh, three-dimensional imaging of uh, the liquid crystal cell. And uh, we have um, the instrument that was defined by uh, Ivan Smaru, that was his uh, PhD topic while at hand. So this um, microscope, the fluorescence and focal polarizing microscope, allows you to image the dimensional patterns of the director. And here I just show the polarizing microscopy texture of this particle with the defect. And here is the same thing, but you, in the vertical cross-section of the cell, you see the top glass, the bottom glass, and the topological defect that is um, visualized by the difference in uh, fluorescent light intensity. And uh, so you have the ability to observe the vertical cross-section of the cell. And that helps because uh, you immediately can uh, decipher the basic question where the particles are located. If I deal with an isotropic fluid with my size of the droplets, about 4 micrometers, I would uh, expect that they would drop eventually at the bottom of the cell and nothing interesting would happen. But it turns out that in the pneumatic phase, when instead of the isotopic fluid they have a pneumatic environment, the situation is entirely different. The droplets hang around in the bulk of the cell and do not drop at the bottom. So what you can do, you can uh, use different cells of different thickness and measure uh, what is the distance between the plate and the droplet, I'm sorry, the, 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 the solid particle. Uh, or the middle plane of the cell and uh, the particle. And uh, then plotted, you will have something like this. This is the cell thickness and this is the shift of the particle, uh, which is uh, 4 micrometer silica sphere, uh, from the center of the cell. Uh, you will have some dependence. You don't know what it means. But then you start to think that um, there is a balance of forces. The first force that acts on this particle 
is obviously the gravity force, and you can easily calculate how large it should be because you know the size of the particle, you know the densities involved. Um, but then you realize that uh, when the particle moves closer to the surface, it distorts the director field around this defect, just because the anchoring at the bottom plate would like to see the director uniform, and it cannot be uniform around the particle. So you have an elastic force that um, pushes the particle upward. Of course, there is the, a similar elastic force between the top plate and the particle. So you consider the balance of these three forces. For the elastic force, you use the expression uh, from um, the Lubensky's article. And you find out that um, this balance of um, three forces gives you a perfect fit of the experimental data on uh, the shift of the particle with the numerical constant, the fitting parameter that is uh, very close to what is expected. An interesting thing for this levitation, elastic levitation, is the bigger the particle, the better is levitation. Here I show the smaller particle and the bigger particle. You might see that the bigger particle is kind of closer to the center of it. So, why is that? Simply because this elastic force of propulsion between the plate and the particle goes as uh, r to the power of 4, and the gravity is on the q. So, if you would have an elephant inside your cell, it would be very, very close to the center of the cell. It wouldn't go down. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, our uh, Korean colleagues observed, and uh, we just realized that here we are dealing with the same uh, limitation feedback. Here, small colloidal particles were dispersed in the texture with uh, focal conic domains that uh, we already discussed. Turned out that they were trapped at the center of the focal conic domains, but they were trapped in such a way that they wouldn't fall down, but would be hanging at some distance from the bottom of the cell, and um, here we are dealing uh, most probably with just a model that we developed, but in the case that the particles prefers to see tangential anchoring, and it moves upward, because the geometry of this focal conic domain is such that near the top, the director is more parallel to the surface of the particle, as opposed to the center, where the director line strikes this particle in a perpendicular fashion. So now, um, I feel, um, yeah, I um, so that was without any field. Now I apply the field, and what I see in this um, uh, confocal microscope is suddenly the symmetry is broken, the director reorients, and uh, the particles start to move. But again, they move uh, not just randomly. The right dipole moves up, and the left dipole moves down. Like that. And uh, then that's the, the final piece of puzzle to explain why the particles show this bidirectional motion. Very simple. And you know that um, reorientation of the director in the liquid crystal cell causes a flow of matter, the so called uh, backflow effect. If I um, suddenly reorient the director, it reorients mostly in the bulb, it remains. Uh, close to the original orientation near the surfaces, and that produces a push that uh, moves the fluid in um, the horizontal direction. Of course, by symmetry, um, the total velocity, so to speak, uh, should be zero, so you have a flow to the right at the bottom and to the left at the top. And uh, that is uh, all we need to explain the motion of the particles, because uh, in uh, the geometry with uh, about few lines, in terms of the radius of the particle, the inertia forces are so. So we can just simply model the backflow effect, and uh, we do that with the standard theory that I just said. And uh, we can calculate what is the flow velocity at different points of the cell on the z axis that is perpendicular to the plates of the cell. So you see here the result for. Uh, Coordinate that is uh, 3 micrometers at the bottom, and then for 18 micrometers at the top, they are symmetric with respect to each other. And then you can repeat the calculations for the case when you switch off the field. The flow would be different, but again, symmetric with respect to the center of the cell. And uh, 
then we calculate the average velocity per period of excitation. And you find that uh, as the function of the frequency with which you send the electric pulses into the system, you have this non-monotonous behavior of the velocity of the backflow per period uh, versus modulation frequency. And it turns out that it uh, describes the experimentally measured velocity of the particles in this bidirectional flow uh, relatively well. So the summary on this is that uh, you, you can use the backflow effects or many other effects, dynamic effects in big crystals to manipulate the colloidal particles and their dynamics and uh, to, to create some conditions when they serve as micromotors without uh, uh, directly uh, applying any force to them through optical physics, for example. And uh, to conclude, uh, I, I just uh, described the three fundamentals of the big crystals. Uh, Nowadays, we have many different directions in which the science of fluid crystals is developing. And uh, those are the field of new materials, chemistry, new effect uh, applications, display related So the original part was only about well, some subfields, colloidal fluid crystals, and valid dispersion effects. But there is much more to study in this uh, field, and uh, at this uh, notion, I will stop. Thank you very much for your attention. I have a question that in this last section, the backflow. So when you switch the field on, then the backflow is going like this. And when you switch the field off again, doesn't the sign change of the backflow? It changed, yeah. but in a very peculiar way. So the question is, uh, I'm trying to apply some of the trade price in this tutorial. So the question is that uh, the switch on and switch off states should be opposite, so. opposite right. in the sign. And it is true, but with subtle differences. So what happens when we switch on is relatively simple. When we switch off, it turns out that there is a non-monotonous in terms of z-dependence. There are some portions of the cell that immediately start to show the motion to the right, but there is a portion here that shows the same sign of the backflow, which then reverses and uh, with some time the entire fluid starts to move only in this direction. So, and here you see the result of uh, simulations. At the very beginning, near at the coordinate, let's say, 18, okay, I, I have the motion in one direction and then it changes sign and continues in the opposite direction. So it's just uh, something that is in fact uh, uh, known for the backflow impact was uh, considered before our work, but we just kind of confirm that this is the case in uh, our simulations. So are the particles always moving forwards or are they going what happens is that uh, what happens is that when you apply the field, the particles go into two different uh, locations. All the left go to the right, and uh, the right particles go to the bottom. So, and then they just are subject to the backflow. But are they always moving forward? Yes. Doing this? No, they, it's a jerking uh, motion. It's not a steady, nice motion. Uh, but uh, on the scale of this uh, movie, you probably wouldn't uh, notice uh, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's average. And again, we didn't attempt to calculate the instantaneous velocity of the particles because it depends on many things. Remember, this, these things are only temporarily near the top or bottom of the cell. So they move in this direction all the time, they move in this direction, so it's a pretty complicated uh, problem. But on average, it appears that the order of magnitude and the overall behavior uh, with maximum can be qualitative. Other questions? Um, I have a question. In the 
and at least when you levitate the particles in the core of the focal point in the lane, and, uh, um, how does a particle find its you know, uh, minimal energy location in the wish? Because in mathematics, um, it's on the in the plane of layers that motion of particles is easy, but it's prone, but also layers it's uh, burnt. So Ivan's question is that um, hydrodynamics of smectics is uh, such that uh, uh, motion in the direction of the normal to the smectic layers is uh, very difficult. In the plane of the layers, the particles can move like in a two-dimensional fluid, but uh, across it's a difficult because it's one-dimensional uh, solid. So, but here, the, the particles are moving from the top to the bottom, and uh, normally the, the top surface is free. So, and although I don't have the dynamics data on this, my thinking is that uh, because of the free surface, you, you have little dimples, little cusps, where the particles would find themselves to locate just because they decrease the gravity there. And then they move down along this defect line where you have practically very few, I mean the layers are mounted here at the core, uh, and uh, they drop down but do not go all the way to the very bottom because they start to realize that uh, going further would increase the surface energy. So this is just a hypothesis that we have, and the calculations show that uh, the force associated with this anchoring is sufficiently uh, large to explain that the particle resists the gravity and doesn't drop down. But um, again, we don't have the dynamics of this motion to tell the exactly the scenario of And how are they creating this array? Uh, this is, uh, in terms of, first of all, uh, not just any smack effect crystal. They uh, synthesized uh, an electric crystal in which uh, part of the molecule, one tail, is uh, fluorinated. And another one is uh, regular CH. Okay. And they found that uh, um, in uh, specially lithographically prepared channels, they create channels, uh, it's uh, very easy to produce the pattern of periodic focal planning domains. The reason is that you see here at the bottom of the focal planning domains, the layers are right. perpendicular to the plate. And so they are sure that uh, the substrate provides this perpendicular orientation of the layers. And then one of the least elastically awkward situations is to produce the focal planning domain because the focal planning domains gives you the opportunity to match the boundary conditions at the free surface and uh, we which are horizontal for the layers and perpendicular boundary conditions at the top. It's kind of a hybrid aligned smectic cell. And they just found by accident that um, you produce uh, uh, an array of uh, hexagonal order focal point domains and the explanation is very simple. It's through the anchoring more questions? Okay, if not, um, let's thank uh, Eric and Malik for their work. And uh, now there's a reception up.